Hello and welcome to a, another edition of Unicorn Chef. Tonight's Unicorn Chef is a good friend of mine, Matt Masterson, um, who is the head of election security at CISA. Um, so for those of you who missed it, uh, he was on a panel with us, which was the first public joint agency panel on election security at DEF CON's Voting Village. Um, so uh, certainly we're coming up on election season, uh, lots of ways to volunteer and to help uh, as a citizen, and we'll be covering some of that during the cooking. Um, I am really excited about this because Matt is bringing a hometown favorite recipe that is not the kind of thing that I've ever seen anywhere outside of Ohio. To be frank, the only time I've ever eaten myself was at the Cleveland airport. So, <laughs> well, you, bad move there. Cincinnati chili and the Cleveland airport's a rough start to, to, to go with. So I, I, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting the full experience here. Um, tonight's charity that we're highlighting is Black Girls Code. So as always, um, please donate, um, share privately or publicly uh, your donations as a part of that. Um, we love to see what you make. So how you make what we make at home. Um, is I think half of the fun of the show. So just hashtag unicorn chef. Um, and to start off with Matt, what are we drinking tonight? So tonight uh, we're drinking uh, from a local brew. We're going to do Cincinnati chili. We're going to do Cincinnati beer. So it's Mad Tree uh, Brewing Company here in Cincinnati. It's just an amber. I'm keeping it light. Normally uh, go with something a little stronger, but going to do a Mad Tree happy amber ale from here in Cincinnati. Very cool. I am uh, much more pedestrian with a Sam Adams Oktoberfest. I love it. I love it. That's in the fridge too, so I'm for you. Cheers. All right, sir. Take us away. All right. So we're making Cincinnati-style chili. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, here in Cincinnati, my hometown, uh, which I, I love and I have a great deal of pride about, uh, chili parlors are a really big thing. Uh, and Cincinnati-style chili, uh, the basis for Cincinnati chili uh, is sort of a, a Greek a Mediterranean background. Uh, it's a sweeter chili, and it's not really a chili that you eat in a bowl. Uh, so you're not going to, no one in Cincinnati goes into a chili parlor really and orders a bowl of chili. You uh, put it on top of pasta, put it on a hot dog, a, a cheese coney, uh, or a burrito. So we're going to make Cincinnati chili. It's a little sweeter. It's got some surprise ingredients on it, and uh, I'm really excited to, to make this here today. And I know it's not as fancy or as exciting as some of the other uh things that you make on here but uh it's it's comfort food and in the midst of this election uh, and working this election some comfort food goes a long way absolutely uh one of the things we pride on ourselves on the show is most of the recipes are not too fancy do not require uh specific appliances um, it's really just about making the kitchen more accessible to everybody and sharing what's special about it from all of the different unicorn chefs Love it. So we're going to start. We're going to cut up, dice up uh, an onion, maybe an onion and a half. Uh, there's not a lot of onion in Cincinnati style chili, but it's there for flavor along with a little bit of garlic. Uh, we'll also turn on our pan here uh, and fire up uh, some olive oil in the bottom of our pan for our chili. Hold it. Do you say a little bit of garlic? Is there such a thing as a little bit of garlic? No, as a matter of fact, you can't have too much. Way. You can't have too much garlic. There's no exactly. such thing. There, there's no such thing, even, even in this chili. So we'll We'll dice up this onion here, put, get the garlic and the onion going, and then uh, we'll move on to our meat. Just uh, for those that don't, a lot of times folks that experience Cincinnati chili for the first time, my wife is a uh, from the western suburbs of Chicago, uh, and she uh, refers to it or thinks it tastes like applesauce, which is not a glowing compliment. Uh, but I love I love the different flavor on this chili. I, I'm a huge fan. Uh, it really is just absolute hometown comfort food for me. Well, I think I would guess I would guess why she's doing that is because of the cloves and the cinnamon that yep. are in it. Yep, absolutely. That's what makes it different. Also, uh, you know, no, uh, it's not meant to be spicy, right? This is not a spicy chili. Some hot. I love hot, and I'll add hot sauce to it once I put it on. Uh, top of the spaghetti or in the in the hot dog, uh, but not not in the chili itself. So we'll get so the onion in. Oh man, oh god. I mean, <laughs> honestly, so I've probably when I was a kid, right, uh, growing up, I and it's not. I mean, a lot of times you just go out to the chili parlor. So you had to Camp Washington chili or Price Hill chili. Skyline chili is the best known 
the Cincinnati style chili parlors. That's the one that's kind of expanded up towards Columbus and, and places like that. But uh, I really like the, the localized ones. In the first place, uh, Empress Chili was actually the first in Cincinnati uh, to do it back in the day. So um, it is, you know, it's got a long storied history here. So most folks usually uh, slow cook a chili all day. Um, so this is something we can throw together in a short period of time or slow cook. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, it says that uh, you can cook it for an hour and then serve it up. I mean, that's probably right. But if you uh, went shorter than that, it's not going to, you know, impact it that much. Again, uh, it's not a chili you're going to eat a, a, a big bowl of, right? And so uh, really the flavors develop. If you've got it going for four hours, uh, you're going to get great flavor, particularly from that bay leaf, right? And the cinnamon uh, and items like that in there. So, uh, you know, I, I think the longer uh, is always better for flavor development, but I, I, for this chili, I don't think it's necessary. Well, All right, like now that we're cooking, and one of my favorite things about cooking, of course, is that you can adjust as you go the yeah. style and flavor. Well, so I, I, uh, my, the first job I ever had, I was uh, 14, uh, and was a prep cook at a restaurant for a friend's family and then cooked breakfast. Uh, and so I haven't used recipes since. Uh, so I probably won't even look, uh, at the measurements or recipes very much, to be honest with you. Uh, because it is, it, it's about creativity and what tastes good to you. Right. All right. Let a, me get the ground. From all of the episodes is most of our chefs don't measure and just sort of go by feel. Yeah. Uh, that's, this is why I can't bake, Bryson, because if I tried to bake, I, I'd never work out. So, all right, so now we're going to uh, ground beef, about uh, two pounds of ground beef in here for this chili. Again, uh, two cups or so of onion. Uh, just break up the ground beef as we go to brown it with the onion uh, and the garlic. And I ended up going about uh, four garlic cloves for what it's worth. They were a little bit bigger. So we'll brown this one up. Also, I have just uh, for those if anyone's making it at home, I have a, a pot of a water getting ready to boil to make the pasta uh, to put this on top of, and I'll explain uh, sort of how that breaks down when you when you order Cincinnati style. A little bit like uh, ordering cheesesteaks in Philadelphia, uh, you got to know what what you're ordering uh, when you go into a chili parlor in Cincinnati on uh, how to order it. Yeah, well, you got to let us know. I will I, once we get to that part. Uh, we'll talk. It's uh, it's actually kind of funny and awkward. <laughs> so, so now we're just brown, I'm... brown in the meat. Sorry, go on. No, go ahead. Browning the meat. Yep. Yeah. So one of the one of the areas where I I went a little uh, hybrid on this is one of the one of the favorite things that I learned from uh, Chris Krebs. Um, oh boy. Was about smoking tomatoes each week, and then I yeah. just have a cup of smoked tomatoes. And I just throw them in anything that requires tomatoes. So I have cherry smoked tomatoes that I have added into um, my chili here. So I'm kind of going for that sweet and smoky. Yeah. Um, really curious how it comes out. I, I, I'm anxious to hear too. Uh, sometimes I like to put uh, the uh, uh, Tabasco Chipotle hot sauce on there that's got that smoky uh, flavor uh, on top of my, my uh, chili. So I'm, I'll be anxious to hear how it goes. Krebs will give me crap for not smoking my tomatoes also. <laughs> mm, yeah, so far so good. <laughs> I was going to say, is it coming together? I love it. So while the meat browns, uh, I'll open up uh, my tomato sauce. Uh, again, if you uh, took the time like Bryson did uh, to, to smoke the, the tomatoes, I love that. Uh, but just adding two big uh, cans of tomato sauce in here, too. So you mentioned that this has Mediterranean roots. Can you walk me through that? Well, little yeah, I did not so see that coming. I was going to ask that question and then you answered. It. I was like, huh. Yeah, so there's it, it's actually uh, a lot of Cincinnatians assume a, a Greek background because the uh, the folks that started Skyline Chili, which again is the most popular, uh, were Greek, but it actually, um, I'll have to, I'll actually Google it while we're standing here. It was actually, uh, you know, same part of the world, but uh, out in the, in the Mediterranean, 
you know, area in and around Greece. And, the, you know, uh, immigrants came here and they took the flavors uh, that they know. So a little, it, the uh, chili tastes a little bit like moussaka, right? The, the baked lasagna, Greek lasagna. It's got that kind of cinnamon clove uh, flavor to it, uh, but, but in a chili. And so that's, that's where the flavors come from. And it just came from uh, folks that moved into the Cincinnati River Valley uh, and, and uh, you know, started up a chili parlor and used the flavors they knew uh, to make it. And we've got, uh, we're fortunate here in Cincinnati, we've got awesome uh, sort of uh, background with food and, and drinks. It was a huge beer town here because the Irish and German immigrants that, that moved here uh, that, that uh, lived in Cincinnati. Uh, and so, for instance, we've got uh, our own type of breakfast sausage called Geta. That's a German breakfast sausage that the German immigrants uh, uh, started eating here. It's not even, they didn't make it in Germany, but it's scraps of pork uh, bound together with pinhead oatmeal. Uh, and you make a patty and it's not scrapple, it's frequently uh, compared to scrapple, uh, but it, it's fantastic. Uh, just great flavor from different parts of pork uh, than the pinhead oatmeal. Yeah, I actually, I just learned about that on Twitter the other week when we were getting into yeah. uh, some Ohio cuisine. Yeah, it's it's my favorite. The other one is, uh, and I learned this the hard way in DC, I went to a Nats game and uh, from going to Reds games my whole life, I went up to the counter to order food and I said, well, I'll have a Met. And he says, a what? And I said, well, I have a Met. And then we, we don't have Mets. And so in Cincinnati, and I had no idea it was only in Cincinnati, we have Met worst. So like a bratwurst, but it's almost like a, a peppery or hot dog uh, and thicker. Uh -huh. uh, but, and I didn't know it was unique to Cincinnati. And the guy's like, look, I could give you a half smoke or I could give yeah. you a hot dog, but I can't give yeah. you a Met. Yeah, no, DC, we've got our half smokes. That's our thing. Right, w which I love, which I love. Yeah, yeah. No, They're different uh, at the Nats game because they deep fry them, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, right. uh, Nashville Stadium has some uh, pretty good food. So, Agreed. Uh, I mean, you're getting uh, you're getting Ben's Chili for the Half Smokes, which is um, a, a DC well-known restaurant. That's that's your like 3 a.m. leaving the bars kind of place. No, I I like the food in Nashville. All right, so we're we're pretty much browned up. Uh, so what we're gonna do. Uh, is add our uh, chicken stock or beef broth. I just happen to have chicken stock, so I'm going to put it in. It won't affect the flavor that much. I'd rather have beef broth, to be honest, uh, but the full box uh, of chicken stock in. Hey, it's pandemic. You you work with whatever you work with. <laughs> well, it's it's. I didn't have time. <laughs> so um, when did you get started in election security? Yeah, so uh, I started, uh, it's almost 15 years ago now. Uh, so I... Got out of law school at the University of Dayton uh, and uh, got a job uh, actually at the Election Assistance Commission uh, for one of the commissioners there and, and kind of got chucked in, had no idea. A friend of the family uh, made a connection for me. And, uh, you know, I, I honestly so lucky I did because uh, there's no better group of people I've ever worked with than election officials. They're the hardest working, best government servants uh, I've ever worked with uh, and just been really fortunate to work in this career since then. Uh, it's, it's been, I, I remember the first election meeting I ever went to, uh, an election official pulled me aside and said, look, if you want to stay in this business, uh, a, after the conference uh, day is over, you head to the bar and just sit with everyone and drink and, and learn from them. And it was exactly right. Election officials are open with their advice, support comments, uh, and drinking. Uh, so just, just a great experience. And then you went on to become a commissioner at the EAC. I, yeah, I did. It was uh, surreal. So I was at the Ohio Secretary of State's office uh, helping to run elections here in Ohio uh, and then got appointed uh, to be a commissioner at the EAC and, and absolutely love that work. And then in uh, 2018, March of 2018, moved over to CISA after elections became part of critical infrastructure uh, to, to work with the team at CISA and Director Krebs. And uh, it's uh, the most fun in a job I've ever had. It's the hardest, uh, just given everything going on. Uh, but I love every day of it. I really do. So now uh, I'll just add my tomatoes in now that the broth is uh, almost boiling. And kind of stir that in. And I had salt and peppered the meat and the onions and the garlic. I'm a big, I'm sure everyone is, but salt and peppering every layer as you go to bring out the flavors, uh, I think really important. So I had salt and peppered. Uh, in there as well. So what advice can you give to our viewers to how they can get involved in the process with elections? 
Oh man, uh, right now, uh, right, we're uh, 27 days uh, from election day. There's still a chance if you're healthy uh, and, and can do it to serve as an election worker. Many places are still taking uh, election workers and need them uh, desperately with COVID. Uh, average age of uh, a poll worker uh, is around, um, you know, 60 plus years of age, right? Uh, high risk category. So making sure that they're taken care of uh, by, by having additional workers. But even if you can't do that, uh, the best thing anybody can do uh, is being prepared uh, to vote, having a plan, understanding what your options are, what's on your ballot, uh, you know, what the process is going to look and feel like for you, whether you're voting by mail, voting early, uh, in person, just knowing what your plan is, uh, and then uh, being uh, patient. Uh, this process looks different this year than it ever has. I've never, I mean, I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, I've never expected a pandemic in combination with, uh, you know, nation state cyber uh, threats in combination with uh, just uh, enormous interest uh, in the election. This is a challenging environment for election officials. So stay patient, waiting to get your ballot, or if you're uh, voting early, your line's going to look longer because of social distancing, but they'll, they'll get you processed and through. Uh, and then election night results are going to take a little bit longer. And then uh, at the end of the day, participating is, is everything. And then, you know, if, if there's folks out there with IT skills, I can tell you there is an election official, local election official, in any of the 8,800 jurisdictions that can't use that that knowledge and support, that's for sure. So how do they how do they get in touch with those uh, officials? Yeah, so if you go to uh, well, one you could just Google uh, your local election, county election, or township election office, or if you go to eac.gov, uh, they actually have a drop down menu where you can look up uh, your local contact point uh, and get in contact with them. So either go to eac.gov or just Google search your local election office. They'll have instructions on how to be a poll worker, um, how to watch pre-election testing the systems, what's on your ballot, where to vote, uh, everything you may need. So, all right, I think we're ready to go to the spices, uh, which is the fun part with Cincinnati style chili. So Cincinnati style chili is gonna have some of your typical uh, seasonings for chili. So I like to put a little cayenne, not much. Again, it's not meant to be hot, but uh, I like a little bit of that flavor. So just a, a sprinkle of cayenne. Uh, you're still going to put a, a good amount of chi chili powder in. Uh, so I just got the, the regular medium chili powder, uh, a good healthy amount of that in just to make sure you've got the, the chili flavor. Uh, a little bit of cumin, which is fairly typical. I'm not a big cumin guy, so I tend to take it a little lighter on the cumin uh, than some. And then, then we start to get weird. Then we start to get into sort of the strange Cincinnati chili, and you've already touched on it, Bryson. Uh, the first is cinnamon. Uh, so Cincinnati style chili uh, has cinnamon in it. Again, those Greek flavors, uh, Mediterranean flavors coming through. Actually, let me get a little bit more cinnamon. That wasn't quite. So we'll just add a little bit more. Mm. You don't want it to taste like uh, applesauce, as my wife says, but you want to taste that that cinnamon, right? Uh, and then a little bit of cloves and allspice in there. Again, you don't want to overdo it with these, but it's what makes it unique uh, and different. Uh, so I always like to give a good healthy amount. Uh, I don't even know what the recipe says for measurements, if I'm being honest. You, you flavor to your taste. <laughs> a little bit of salt and pepper again. And then the sort of weirdest ingredient, chocolate. Uh, so Cincinnati style chili, uh, a lot of times when people mock it, uh, they call it uh, dessert or, oh, you put chocolate in there. So just, just you know, two small squares, one small square of, of Baker's chocolate, unsweetened uh, chocolate in there. It really does make a difference. It also gives it some color, uh, makes it a little bit darker. Uh, so a couple squares uh, just dropped right in uh, and a bay leaf. So I have, I have had chocolate in chili that is not Cincinnati before. So that's actually was it like the sweet, sweet and spicy? No, no. It actually it just gives it like a darker flavor. It's not like yeah. sweet, right? Because it's like not a mole. Chocolate, but it's like more of that. Again, I really like. I always think of umami, right? When I'm thinking of my yeah. my five flavors, and it just gives it kind of this like base dark taste. Oh yeah, this is smelling good already, and we're just getting started. Yeah, I'm I'm starving. <laughs> I've been smelling it all day. I've been walking yeah. around my house going. Well, so I'd be interested. I mean, does that when you taste it and, and ha, does this 
the cinnamon throw you off? No, no, it's um, it's it's very um, it's like a third level flavor, right? Like yeah, I'm, I'm tasting chili. I'm tasting um, kind of again with the chocolate. There is a like darker level, and then the cinnamon is like a finish. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to describe it. So I'm gonna uh, get my pasta ready here too. Just spaghetti, uh, regular spaghetti for this. I like to salt the water. Yep, I'm almost boiling. I forgot I even had the beer over there. Got the chili just kind of simmering. Uh, again, it says an hour or so. Uh, for the sake of your viewers, obviously I won't wait that long, but uh, By that's, way, you know. We're doing a pasta dish and all y'all keto people who are so excited about keto. Um, traditional durum wheat semolina, like the real stuff that you actually can get, not like the like craft equivalent. The real stuff actually is not as high in like the simple carbohydrates um, and where pasta gets a bad rap. It is actually really high in protein and is, I mean, it's not pure keto, but it's not as bad as it gets a wrap for. I, I love that. I've been trying to, to stay away from, uh, not keto, but stay away from the carbs. And uh, the other option here, so just to go into sort of how you, you order Cincinnati style chili. So when you, when you go in, you got some options uh, and you'll look at the menu. And first it'll, for the, the chili and spaghetti, it'll say a three-way, a four-way, or a five-way. So a three-way is spaghetti, chili, cheese. That's it. A four-way is chili or spaghetti, chili, and then your choice of onions or beans and cheese. And then a five-way is spaghetti, chili, beans, and onion and cheese. And then there's one place here, which I love, uh, Blue Ash Chili, that adds a six-way, which is uh, deep-fried jalapeno bottle caps, which mm. I think is a nice twist on it uh, and really good as well. So. Uh, very, very good. Uh, but that's that's the chili spaghetti. Then on the menu, it'll also have cheese conies, uh, which is just a hot dog, uh, you know, in a, in a bun with chili and cheese. But you get to choose mustard or onion on there uh, as well. So uh, depending on how you like it, I like it with mustard, just straight up yellow mustard, uh, no onion when I get a cheese coney. So they, uh, they they don't they don't cook the beans in with the chili then it's just like they do not yeah this is no no beans in the chili they have uh, cooked beans so they'll cook it from dry uh, cooked beans in a in a pot that they scoop up ladle out and throw on top of the chili instead of cooking it in there yep so this is I mean the chili's pretty simple right uh, they just have a pot of beans there's just a pot of beans uh, go yes that they ladle yep ladle it out it's it. Uh, you go in and they're like a factory, right? They got the steam table in the middle, uh, just slinging chili. So now the, we, um, we, we were talking about it on dogs. Um, it's the same kind of chili. It's a sweet chili that's going to yep. put it on dogs. Yep. So you're, and I've got uh, hot dogs and buns too, so we could do that if we want to. Uh, but the, you're going to uh, order a cheese coney. Uh, it's going to be a hot dog and bun. And then uh, they put the mustard on the inside of the bun and onion on top and then put the chili. And the key the key to this is sharp cheddar cheese uh, on top. You need a good sharp cheddar cheese uh, on top and a nice pile. And I'll show you when I when I played up. Uh, but that's absolutely the key to Cincinnati style chili is to have that good sharp cheddar cheese uh, to add to it. And there's there's a couple other little uh, tricks or or uh, what Cincinnati hacks uh, to enjoy it. So we'll, I'm not we'll I'm not drizzling we'll mustard on. I'm actually slathering it on the bun. Yep, you then... slather. Yep. Take a knife, right. put it on the inside, and I'll show you when I played up. I'll, I'll do uh, at least one hot dog. I'm not a big – I actually, to confess, and this is sort of a sin in Cincinnati, I don't like hot dogs, and so I get what's called a chili sandwich, uh, which is no hot dog in there. So I just slather the chili, the chili and mustard in there and a big pile in of cheese. Uh, what, and did, that did, did Upton Sinclair get to you? Yeah, I don't – I I love a good broad or met. I, I can't do a hot dog. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it is. It makes me a bit un-American, I think. Uh, but I, I can't do it. Well, I mean, so it's October. I mean, what about rock bursts or? Oh, love, 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 absolutely love. All right, yeah. so you don't, you don't, you don't like the lowbrow pedestrian hot dog. I, you like? I mean, there, I awesome. could be accused of that. Yeah, I mean, I've got a body that looks like I enjoy hot dogs, but not, not uh, a big fan of them. I don't know. Yeah, you I, there. I didn't say it, man. Yeah. Oh, look, I'll go there all day. It's just, uh, you know, just the you reality. Know, you know, I teach yoga Monday to Friday. You are welcome to come and join us anytime. 
Yeah, that would probably go well for me. I that would I'd have to ask for the week off after we we knocked out some yoga. <laughs> oh yeah, we got a good boil going on. The poses, it's just straight up yoga. It's not hard. I love it. Yeah, tell me about. Uh, I know I'm tracking you on Twitter. Uh, some of the uh, uh, workout uh, sort of hashtags and stuff. I mean, there's some yoked folks tweeting at you. Yeah, so um, there's a there's a group of about of a hundred of us who are on the Whoop. So Whoop is this like um, it's basically an optical sensor you just wear full time. Okay. And um, the way it even charges, it's actually really cool the way it charges. It has like a clamshell that clips on top. Um, and by the way, any of you at home who who want a Whoop, we can do like a month free thing. So yeah, me and I'll get the code. Um, but anyway, so it's just an optical sensor you're wearing all the time, and it's really cool because it two things that have come from it. One is the engagement with the community, um, which is a ton of fun. And our primary hashtag is red team fit, but there's also defer fit, and blue team fit. There's all the fits. Um, my hashtag is hacker yoga for the yoga that I teach. Um, and then the other thing about it that I didn't expect is while I'm certainly focused on working out and it helps remind me for that, it's been me um, cutting, about, cutting down on the amount I drink and getting to sleep in a consistent amount and really focused on sleep, that's yeah. been the biggest strange benefit I didn't expect to get out of a fitness band. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Especially uh, during these stressful times, man, that those workouts, getting the heart rate up, stuff like that, especially, I, I don't know about others, but you know, I'm sitting at home working all day, like not moving, it's just not healthy. You, you only got like another month of stress, you know. Yeah. Or two or three. day plus. X. That's all you got. <laughs> yeah. It's the uncertainty that makes it the hardest, right? Oh, oh I, I knew. Think, particularly this year. <laughs> yeah. It'd be it'd be like in 2000, knowing the hanging chat is coming and going, how long is it going to take? And what can I do? Yeah. It's, you know, for me, it's just uh, what, what more can we do to help these election officials in these counties? Uh, anticipate some of that, right? Uh, they're just in a really tough position between COVID and, and securing the systems. It's it's hard, man. That's where the patience comes in. Lawn, what would you do? I'd get a more IT resources, more IT support, for sure. I mean, it's just understandably county governments uh, as a whole just you know don't have the resources uh, to commit broadly to, to IT support, uh, let alone elections. And and the election office in most counties is the largest IT operation in the county just by number of assets, right? So you're talking yeah. voting systems, e-poll books, ballot on demand printers, you know, just uh, desktops and business systems. Uh, and they just, uh, they really need the support. Yeah, so that's something I think a lot of people don't realize is in the last few years, uh, we've gotten a lot of attention on the machines themselves. And we're slowly getting to the point that the machines are starting to get looked at, let's just say a little bit harder than in the past, like the security, security fig leaf is, is going away. Yeah, for sure. And the complexity of the infrastructure that supports it. I mean, you talk about the election officials. I mean, we're, we're talking about 8,800 different jurisdictions throughout that are all on different generic operating systems and computers, their own ability to understand those things. You talk about poll books, so poll books are becoming increasingly electronic, which is the voter registration at the point of understanding if a voter is valid or not. Voter registration itself, reporting the results, tabulating the results, right? Like this whole complex system of all of these different pieces. And I think that's the part that still hasn't gotten enough attention. Yep. Yeah. The the amount of systems they have to run, own, operate, get support and and uh, you know, honestly, the level of both reliance and support they get from the private sector is, is amazing. I mean, you're I mean, a lot of election office. You could be looking at 10, 15 different vendors just on the election specific type of support. Right. Forget, you know, Microsoft being involved in, in others. And so it's it's you're asking. And, and the, the real challenge for them is, uh, you know, many county election officials, you know, are logistical whizzes. Right. That that was their job. Organize, be detailed, uh, make sure everyone can. Uh, can come to the party and participate and now we've thrown in oh you got to be a complex it system manager uh on top of it right and it's it's a lot it's a lot 
Well, it's similar to what we've seen in critical infrastructure through all sure. of the sectors, right? The, yeah. The folks responsible for installing, operating, and maintaining them were not IT people. They weren't computer people. They were like, I know how to put this thing in place. I know how to maintain this thing. I know how to do the safety checks on it, and I know how to replace it in 30 years. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's it is the good news is, and, and this is probably true in other areas of critical infrastructure. <laughs> Uh, election officials are so detailed and uh, resilience oriented already, forget their systems, their job uh, that they spend most of their time thinking about is what could go wrong? How do I prepare for it? Okay, what else could go wrong? And so, I mean, I remember talking to a local election official in New Hampshire, in a township in New Hampshire, who had a full plan that if, if the nuclear power plant not too far away from town melted down, he knew how he was going to pack up and move far enough outside the fallout zone to keep running that election. Uh, and that's that's the level of detail and thought they put to it. So how do we apply that to their management of their systems, right? Uh, because that that's that's their con their mantra day in and day out. So what do you the other the other thing I think it's an interesting intersection with with elections is certainly there's been a lot of attention in the last four years around foreign influence and interference. But if you think about it, I mean, going back to the fact that one of the biggest things that have really been pushing around voting has been around civil rights. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that, that's been true, right, for, for uh, ever. And uh, the, the changes that have been made since 2000, right, so the Help America Vote Act after, and I'm dating myself now, I, I spoke to a college class not too long ago and mentioned Bush v. Gore, and they looked at me like, yeah, no idea, no idea what's <laughs> happening there. Uh, and I'm like, oh yeah, I am old. Uh, but why, since why was the plant fighting a bull? I don't understand. You're right, 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 exactly. Uh, they, the changes they made, uh, the technology and what it's been able to support uh, has really allowed for this expansion and changes uh, to improve access to to lay, So you know, 2000 require Help America Vote Act then requires the establishment of statewide voter registration databases. So okay, now the states got a database of all registered voters, what can we do that with that? Okay, online registration comes about, voter lookup tools come about, uh, uh, polling place lookup tools and, and uh, blank ballot distribution and things like that, uh, because now we've got this centralized point where all that data that we need to do those things sits in the statewide voter registration database. And so we've seen early voting and vote by mail and uh, you know these options, convenience voting, uh, take hold since 2000 kind of slowly uh, because, you know, it takes time uh, to do it in a way uh, that they have confidence uh, that they can administer it. But, uh, you know, we've really seen a lot of improvements about making it easier uh, to vote. Uh, and I think there's been a demand from voters that that this one day uh, to vote on isn't uh, isn't going to work for many voters. And so how do we do it? So in Ohio, I know just from 2011 to, to now, uh, now more than half of the voters in Ohio will vote before Election Day. Right. Uh, and that wasn't the case uh, coming out of 2000. Right. And so those those are the kind of changes uh, that you see in the evolution on it. All right. I feel, think uh, my feel comfortable sharing how you're going to vote, not not who you're voting for, but how. Yeah. So I actually got my ballot today, which is awesome. So uh, Secretary LaRose here in Ohio uh, followed uh, on the footsteps of Secretary Husted and, and did absentee ballot applications. So I'll register voter here in Ohio. So I applied for an absentee uh, and received it today. Uh, so I'll, I, I really enjoy having the opportunity to sit down with my kids and go over the ballot. I think uh, they they really uh, what they enjoy it, and it's a great chance to teach them. I love when parents take kids to the polls also, but I didn't want to do that in COVID with my kids uh, this time around. Uh, and so uh, I'll sit down with them, I'll vote, and then I will probably drive down to the local election office uh, and drop it off there in part just because my local election official uh, here in Hamilton County, Sherry Poland's just an awesome human being, and I like dropping in and, and saying hi to her. So I'll probably drive my ballot down, uh, drop it off to Sherry, and say hello while I'm there. You, what are you doing? Um, so I have my absentee ballot as well. Um, so uh, both of us are clearly demonstrating how we believe in mail-in ballots and their ability to uh, work. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be doing the same thing. Love it. If that's my so ballot, me... it's right over there on the table. And I really like that idea about sitting down with the kids and talking through this. Um, I was driving my daughter the other day and she's like, well, who are you going to vote for? And I was like, are you really asking your father about you know, <laughs> violating the democratic principles of a secret vote? Um, 
but I think that's a great idea to make them a part of the process at a young age. Um, that was not something I ever experienced. And I think that's a fantastic way to help, you know, bring up young citizens into it. Yeah, so there's a lot of actually really good academic research about uh, the, the earlier you can involve uh, kids, the more likely they are to be regular voters uh, in, in the process. And so to the extent that there's an option for that or an ability to do that, uh, understanding some parents uh, can't, uh, that, uh, you know, it, it really helps show them the process. And you can walk through, uh, plus they ask me a lot what I do. They, they just say you're on the phone a lot, which is fair. Uh, so it's kind of fun to show that, that the end result of that. All right, so I think my pasta is done. So I'll pull it off here. And then we can uh, get to Platon if you're ready. I am just about ready. And I'm going to throw a couple hot dogs down just to, to make a couple conies for experience sake here. I'm going to add a red onion on top of mine. I well, mean, don't so so don't onion. add it. Don't add it on top of the spaghetti. You got to put the chili on first. Yeah. So I'll show you here. I'll 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 plate one up here. Nope, I'm putting this on top of my chili. Yep. So we I go, and you need a good beans. tight pile of pasta here. And then we're going to go and we're going to ladle up a nice – and again, Cincinnati-style chili is not meant to be thick, so you notice we didn't put any tomato paste in, right? Quite a bit of liquid, uh, that entire box. It's meant to be uh, lighter like a sauce, right? Again, you're not, you're not really going in and, and ordering a big bowl of it. Uh, you're looking to create oh, – this looks great. I'm excited. It smells so good. So now I've got uh, – here, I'll try to show you here, but I've got my – I'm not a cameraman, clearly. So I've got my, uh, woo, I'm gonna spill it. But my chili and my sauce here. Uh -oh. uh, and then we'll uh, add, I'm, I'm gonna go, I, so my traditional order, and this is in part why I'm gonna make the hot dogs. My traditional order uh, when I go to a Cincinnati chili place uh, is a three-way. Uh, so again, that's spaghetti, chili, cheese. Uh, and then two chili sandwiches, because I don't like hot dogs, but I'll, I'll make a regular one. So two chili. So now we go with a nice, healthy topping of sharp cheddar cheese. And you cannot skimp on the sharp cheddar. It's absolutely critical. So we got the three-way done. Oh, yeah. You're looking good there. Looking real good. And then the other little hidden secret here that that every uh, chili parlor in Cincinnati is going to offer you, you got to have the oyster crackers and they'll bring you the oyster crackers while you're waiting for your for your meal. Right. And so what what your average Cincinnati will do, you get a nice little bowl of them is uh, they'll take they'll get their bowl of oyster crackers. Uh, I've got and they'll crack open the top of one of the oyster crackers, or if it already has a crack, so this one I'll try to show it, but this one's got a nice little top, and put a little hot sauce in it. And you start eating a little oyster crackers and hot sauce as your appetizer uh, before before you get rolling over to the chili. So we put a little dab in there, and just have a little oyster cracker and hot sauce. And then once you have your three-way, so once I have my, my chili, I don't want to pour it out of the bowl, but uh, chili and spaghetti, you're going to have a nice little – uh, leftover at the bottom, you drop your oyster crackers into the bottom of the bowl once you fill it finished off and, and soak it up. And that's that's the way to get that done with the three-way. Let's see yours. Let's see it. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I love the onions. What kind of so, and let, so you can yeah. see the these are the uh, these are the tomatoes I smoked over cherry. Oh yeah. Cherry wood. And you'll see. I mean, look at that nice, healthy cheddar cheese uh, piling there. I think I got it now. I mean, yeah, don't oh, yeah. don't be don't skimp on the on the cheese. I, I skimped. I, I did not match that level. Hold on, hold yeah. on. Yeah, cannot skimp on. It's absolutely vital to a to a three way. And then I think my hot dogs are ready. 
So then we'll plate up a couple of conies too. Oh yeah. All right, so we, as I said, you take a little yellow mustard on the inside of the bun here. Don't need a lot, but just enough so you taste it. Is there a name for the disgusting liquid that comes out of mustard if you don't shake the mustard bottle? Someone should name that. <laughs> there Someone is should not. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's the worst because you forget you to shake it. And then it you're like, Damn it. Yeah, and you're like, yeah. I. Why? We need to name that. Uh, so I got I got my bun with a little mustard in there. I'll take and, and load up with a hot dog, uh, and then we're just gonna ladle. And again, onions in here. You can put onions in here with the mustard. I'm, I don't like to put onions in. I don't know why. I just grew up without it. A little bit of the, the chili on there. And then again, a nice, big, heaping pile of cheese. And we got ourselves a coney too. So now I got my three-way. I got my coney. I got my beer. And we're ready to have some comfort food. Watch Joe Burrow play for the Bengals and lose. Is, is what we're ready for now. This is, this is how it's done. All right, well, let's finish it off with our picture. I mean, I gotta get a fork. <laughs> well, you gotta, show, you gotta show chili. Yeah, I gotta, I don't wanna spill it. Yeah, uh, got it. We good? Ready? Ready. Got it. Yes. Delicious. All right, Matt, thank you very much for sharing your Cincinnati chili with us. Um, EAC.gov for a lot more information on how you can be a part yep. of the democratic process at and, home. And helpamericavote.gov is where you can go to sign up to be a poll worker. So helpamericavote.gov uh, to help folks be a poll worker. And uh, our charity for tonight is Black Girls Code. Um, reminder, hashtag your deliciousness at home with Unicorn Chef. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Dude, thank you. This was so much fun. And bring that up. There we go. There we go. I'm sharing.